Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and The Shining, Stanley Kubrick's 1980 horror masterpiece based on Stephen King's 1977 novel, has shined its chilling influence through nearly every successive film and TV series of our lives, both in horror genres and even scarier places like the Pixar universe. The Shining's lingering mysteries have made it one of the most overanalyzed films of all time. There is even a documentary about conspiracy theory interpretations that make New Rockstars theories sound like Occam's very rational razor. Let us dive deep into The Shining, point out all the subtle evidence for the various interpretations of the film's hidden meanings and details that are only now being spotted. Okay, the film opens with Jack Torrance, Jack Nicholson, as he drives to the Overlook Hotel for his interview. These aerial shots of Glacier National Park were actually later repurposed for the reshot ending of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. But it's the music here that renders all these beautiful landscapes so frightening. The main shining theme was composed by Wendy Carlos and Rachel Elkind, adapting a traditional Gregorian chant called Dies Irae, which translates to Day of Wrath, and it was used for for funerals. So the reason that we're so on edge here is that the music is prepping us for a funeral in which a higher power will decide whether we will end up in heaven or trapped in hell. Mixed in with this music is a doom-inspired soundscape mixed by music editor Gordon Stainforth. Yeah, you hear voices shriek and echo like warnings from the past. Many have interpreted The Shining as a metaphor for the human history of violence and genocide continuing to haunt our unconscious psyche until it eventually catches up to us. So we arrive at the Overlook Hotel, the exterior of which was based on the Timberline Lodge in Fort Hood, Oregon, though Kubrick recreated it as a set at Elstree Studios in England. You may have noticed that he condensed the recreated exterior to exclude the Timberline's pointed tower, one of many examples of the Overlook's famous impossible architecture, as if this place is a deceptive maze, an illogical death trap. Now, Stephen King got the idea for his shining novel after he and his family stayed in the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado. They were the final guests before it shut down for the winter, and King saw a group of nuns leaving the hotel and started to wonder if the place was godless, as I'm sure he wonders about every place he enters. But notice in this wide shot that there are exactly 42 cars in the parking lot. Now, the number 42 also shows up later on Danny's Bugs Bunny shirt, and later when they watch the TV, a TV that has no power cord, by the way, they watch the movie The Summer of 42. Some point to this recording number 42 as evidence that this movie could actually be about the Holocaust. Since Hitler's final solution was ordered in 1942, there's also a huge influence on Jack's typewriter being a German Adler brand and typewriters being a symbol of the Nazis' obsessive documentation of their war crimes. These folks have also argued that the final cross dissolve on the photo of Jack leaves a brief superimposition of his hairline on his upper lip to create the illusion of a Hitler mustache, which you could interpret as an homage to Hitchcock's famous superimposition of Mrs. Bates' skull on Norman's face in the final shot of Psycho. Now that photograph is actually right behind Jack as he first enters the Overlook lobby. We just overlooked it. This is the first of many smooth tracking shots that Kubrick accomplished with a Steadicam, one of the first prominent uses of the device. Kubrick never cuts here, and it leads to this unsettling feeling as Jack rounds the corner into Omen's office. Notice that window. If you were to map the layout of the hotel, the window in Ullman's office is considered an impossible window because Ullman's office should be in the building interior. There's no courtyard behind that room. It's actually implied that the building goes way deeper. And that's just one of many visual curiosities in this shot. There's also this Native American painting on the outside of the office. This is called The Great Mother by artist Norval Morceau. When asked about this painting, Kubrick said that every face that surrounds Jack here is an archetype. And that connects to the book visible on Ullman's desk there. This is the Red Book of Carl Jung. Young. Young being the famous psychoanalyst known for his writings about the collective unconscious and archetypes. Young defied archetypes as universal symbols that all human beings innately associate collective meanings to. The mother is one of the most famous archetypes. So you can use these Easter eggs as a kind of roadmap with which to analyze the rest of this film, which is a collection of meaningful symbols that hit us on a subconscious level. You'll notice that there are Native American references throughout the Overlook. Are all these Indian designs authentic? Yeah, I believe uh, they're based mainly on Navajo and uh, Apache motifs. The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. 
Many believe that these references symbolize The Shining's deeper meaning as a parable about white violence toward indigenous peoples, with the blood from the elevators actually coming from the graves of the Native Americans buried underneath. White man's burden, Lloyd, my man. White man's burden. So Ullman tells Jack about a winter caretaker in the past named Charles Grady, who murdered his wife and daughters due to what they believed at the time to be cabin fever. But Jack is weirdly unfazed. Well, you can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not going to happen with me. Yeah, you'll notice that Jack already seems a bit unhinged here, and that's a credit to Jack Nicholson's impressive performance. Nicholson's casting was a major point of contention from Stephen King, who famously hated the film adaptation of his novel. So King based Jack Torrance in the novel on himself, a struggling writer who has sudden terrifying thoughts of murdering his kids and fought through substance abuse. To him, Jack's transformation is so scary because Jack starts as a relatable everyman, how King viewed himself. But then he fell victim to external supernatural forces. King saw Nicholson as an actor famous for playing unhinged characters, like in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But this was Kubrick's primary diversion from King's text. Kubrick said in an interview that Jack comes to the hotel psychologically prepared to do its murderous bidding. He doesn't have very much further to go for his unhinged frustration to become completely uncontrollable. He's bitter about his failures as a writer, he's married to a woman for whom he has only contempt, he hates his son, and the hotel, at the mercy of its powerful evil, he is quickly ready to fulfill his dark role. I'm hungry. Well, you should have eaten your breakfast. Kubrick elaborated, there's something inherently wrong with the human personality. There is an evil side to it. One of the things that horror stories can do is show us the archetypes of the unconscious. We can see the dark side without having to confront it directly. So Ullman also tells Jack that they're going to have to keep the hotel's boiler running during the winter. Now, this detail relates to another major difference in the book, which ends with the overlook burning down after the boiler explodes, and the cycle of violence ending, as opposed to Kubrick's ending, which keeps that cycle going and going and going. Meanwhile, Jack's wife Wendy, Shelley Duvall, and son Danny, Danny Lloyd, wait back in their home in Boulder when he reads The Catcher in the Rye, a book with its own links to various conspiracies associated with John Hinckley Jr. and Mark David Chapman, though it should be noted Reagan and Lennon were shot after The Shining came out. And we meet Danny's imaginary friend, Tony. What about Tony? He's looking forward to the hotel, I bet. Tony, it's a torch! So in the novel, Tony is actually Danny's adult self, speaking to him from the future, since Danny's middle name is Anthony, or Tony for short, but there is a much darker theory about who Tony is. Now the next shot we see of Danny, he is framed in the doorway to his bathroom, brushing his teeth. He asks Tony to tell him why he doesn't want to go to the hotel. Danny is suddenly struck with a vision of the blood elevator, the Grady twins, and himself screaming the moment Halloran gets killed. This leads to Danny suffering a panic attack and getting examined by a doctor who asks who Tony is. The little brat lives in my mouth. If you were to open your mouth now, could I see Tony? No. Why not? Because he hides. Where does he go? To my stomach. So, notice here that Danny is also lying on this bear pillow. His pants are off and he's covering himself. Later, in Danny's bedroom at the Overlook, there's a painting of two bears over his bed, one sitting, one standing. A detail, by the way, that pops up at time code 2237. The movie goes inside room 237 two times, and Wendy runs over a bear rug in between those two visits. Why am I mentioning all this bear stuff? Well, there is a theory that Danny is connected to the man in the bear costume. Shortly after this checkup, Wendy tells the doctor that Danny dislocated his shoulder five months prior because Jack had been drinking and grabbed Danny away from scattering his papers across the floor. So we are looking at a history of child abuse. So again, that WTF moment, the mysterious bear costume ghost giving oral sex to the older man, seen later by Wendy in the final sequence. The theory is that Jack has sexually abused Danny, and that Danny represents the man in the bear costume, both are seen partially nude, both are framed the same way in key moments. Tony, in this case, would be Jack's, you know, Jack. Yuck, I know, I know. I will explain more of this dark interpretation as it pertains to the way Room 237 is depicted, but before we move on, notice that as Wendy and the doctor leave Danny's bedroom, the dopey sticker that was once on the door is now missing. Now, there are many interpreters in the camp that Kubrick is a master filmmaker who makes no mistakes in this film, everything's intentional. If you're in that camp, you could read this as a kind of loss of innocence for Danny, now aware of the violent horrors that await him thanks to the vision. He's no longer a dopey kid. In fact, his nickname is another dwarf, Doc, which is actually for Bugs Bunny. But if you think about it in Snow White and the Seven Doors, Doc is also like the most awakened, aware, haunted of that bunch. 
He's always got that thousand yard stare. Anyway, the whole family heads up to the Overlook and Jack, when he's sitting in the lobby, reads a magazine that, if you look closely, is a Playgirl, the January 1978 issue, which includes the article, Incest, Why Parents Sleep With Their Children. Another clue that many point to evidence for Jack's sexual appetite, which we see as he checks out other guests, and possible sexual abuse of Danny, an incestual relationship. Because why else would the set dresser put a freaking Playgirl in a lobby of a hotel? Now, trailing behind Ullman is Bill Watson, the summer caretaker, is very limited dialogue, but when he does, he seems a bit on edge. Bill, would you have the Torrance's things brought to their apartment? Fine. I better collect my family first. Yikes, Bill's having a day. This could be another hint that past caretakers do not take well to this hotel. Bill is super eager to leave. Now in the game room, Danny gets his first visit from the Grady twins. Now let's look at this shot. There's one interpretation that has pointed to that Monarch skiing poster, suggesting that the silhouetted skier actually looks very much like a Minotaur, as a metaphor for Jack being the Minotaur monster of the Greek myth of the labyrinth. The reason why a lot of people believe this is that the hedge maze was famously a detail not in King's novel. Kubrick created it originally for this film. And there are several clues throughout this film that establish the exterior maze as a duplicate of the interior maze of the hotel itself. Yeah, this whole place is such an enormous maze. I feel like I'll have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs every time I come in. And both of those mazes reflect the even deeper maze of Jack's sanity. So getting lost in a maze represents losing one's sense of self. This mind maze metaphor has come up again and again since The Shining, and things like Inception, Westworld, Jordan Peele's Us. Ultimately, Danny's ability to retrace his steps represents his ability to navigate his own mind, keep himself from going insane. You could also argue it reflects his respect for the past, something that his psychic knowledge of gave him an advantage to save himself from his father's insanity. Halloran talks to Danny about their shared telepathic abilities, which he calls Shining. Now, Stephen King came up with the term Shining from John Lennon's song, Instant Karma. But we all the idea being that all human souls leave a trace in the historical record behind. You know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Say, like, if someone burns toast, well, maybe things that happen leave other kind of traces behind. So even if interpretations of The Shining as a story about the Holocaust or the genocide of the Native Americans weren't explicit, on a broader thematic level, this is a movie about the corruptive power of past violence on the fragile collective unconscious of each of our inner demons. Now Kubrick works in some fun visual foreshadowing in this moment. Mr. Halloran, are you scared of this place? No. For the first time, after several minutes in the scene, Kubrick cuts to wide revealing the knives on the column right over Danny's head, the same knife that Wendy will later use to defend them from Jack and that Danny picks up in the bedroom. So the shine is answering Danny's question in this moment. So Danny asks about room 237, Halloran warns him to stay out. And a month later, we see Danny driving his big wheel on the ground floor of the Overlook. This is the first ever use of a low angle steady cam. They did this so that Danny's big wheel would explode with sound whenever he went over wood and then go abruptly eerily silent whenever he went over carpet. Danny rides a total of three times in this movie. Analysts have mapped out the route of the hotel's geography. Each time he rides on a different floor, and when he rounds corners, there's nothing there. The second time, on the second floor, Kubrick includes shots of the second floor railing overlooking the Colorado Lounge, just to give you a sense of how these two routes connect. But for the third big wheel ride later in the movie, Kubrick uses those simple expectations that he set to now trick us. Danny rides through the kitchen, but as he rounds the corner, he suddenly teleports. He's now pedaling on the upper level by the family suites. And now when he rounds the corner, who knows what we'll see? Oh, f it's the Grady twins. But more on that later. So Wendy brings Jack breakfast in bed, and we initially see Jack sleeping, but it's through a mirror. It's a misdirect by Kubrick. Jack isn't the important element in the shot. The mirror is. It is this mirror that Wendy will later see red rum turning into murder, and it has a deeper special meaning that I will get to. But in this shot, we stay on the image of Jack through the mirror. His shirt says Stovington, which in King's novel is the name of the high school that Jack teaches at. When I came up here for my interview, it was as though I'd been here before. It was almost as though I knew what was going to be around every corner. Yeah, there's a lot of foreshadowing going on here. Danny and Wendy get surprised by ghosts jumping out at them from behind corners in this film, but not Jack. And from Halloran's perspective later, Jack is the demonic presence popping out from behind the corner. And that is because, as we see in the final shot, Jack was destined to be a part of the horror of the Overlook. 
he has always been there. So as Jack's writer's block sets in, Wendy and Danny play in the hedge maze. The camera follows them as they round corners, and then we cross dissolve to Jack. Now, Kubrick uses long cross dissolves throughout this film, creates all kinds of interesting superimpositions. But this one is my favorite because for a moment, Jack's large form is superimposed over Wendy and Danny as if he is stalking them through the maze, just as he will for Danny later on. Kubrick underlines Jack's predatory posture by having Jack looming over the miniature maze. We cut from Jack looking down over it with a wolf-like grin, or a minotaur-like grin, I guess, to an overhead shot of Danny and Wendy tiny in the center of the maze, as if Jack is a giant having trapped them inside. Now, the maze built for the movie was not this large or elaborate. Kubrick filmed Wendy and Danny from overhead, but then edited this so that the central part of the maze would be lifted out and then placed into a scale model of the maze. So, just as Jack's imagination is doing, Kubrick used a visual effect to shrink them to fit inside Jack's mind. So, the second time Danny rides his big wheel, he passes room 237. Now, this second floor hexagonal carpet pattern is now infamous in production design. The Pixar animators used it in the hallway carpet for Sid's house. It also recently showed up on the back of the kid's skateboard in It Chapter 2. So Wendy checks in on Jack, who's typing away. We later learn that he is just typing the phrase, all work and no play make Jack a dull boy, over and over and over again, suggesting that even in this moment, this guy has already completely snapped. <laughs> Now, notice the scrapbook on the table beside him. This was left over from a deleted scene in which Jack found this scrapbook in the basement, chronicling events from the hotel's dark past with photographs setting up the final image photograph. In the novel, the scrapbook is a much bigger plot point. The Overlook struggles trying to possess Danny, so it moves on to Jack, feeding on his writer's block and enticing him with the rich history of the hotel via the scrapbook. So Jack cruelly cusses out Wendy, but notice the chair behind him. It is there at first, but then we cut to Wendy, then back to Jack, and the chair is gone. And then it reappears the next time we cut back to Jack. Now, again, assuming Kubrick never makes any mistakes, this could reflect Jack's insanity. Like when he played with the ball earlier, there was no chair pulled up to the table because think about it, the camera was in place where the chair would have been. The chair back against the wall means that it's not at the table because Jack isn't writing. It was still pulled back against the wall. Jack's mind keeps mentally projecting the chair pulled away from the table because he knows he is not actually progressing on his book. Jack later watches Wendy and Danny play in the snow, giving them this murderous look. Kubrick loves this expression, downward tilt, eyes up, mouth hung open, a kind of a drooling smile. It's the same exact face that Private Pile made in Full Metal Jacket. It's this soulless, animalistic glare. Okay, so jumping ahead, Danny rounds the corner to find the Grady twins. Come and play with us, Danny. Forever. And ever. And ever. Yeah, I know, it messed me up too. The Grady twins have been paid homage in a ton of films. One recent example was Jordan Peele's Us. The twins of that movie were slaughtered and posed in the same exact way as the Grady twins were. Now the next day, Danny runs into Jack in their suite. Jack is framed in the mirror, again, staring creepily at Danny. Now remember this shot, and he tells Danny to sit with him. This interaction just feels so uncomfortable. The music makes it seem like something could go wrong at any moment. Dad? Yes? Do you feel bad? No. So tired. Then why don't you go to sleep? I can't. I got too much to do. Now, Stephen King's sequel to The Shining is called Dr. Sleep. It's been adapted into a 2019 film with Ewan McGregor as an adult Danny Torrance, in that Danny uses his shine as a hospice nurse helping people go to sleep. Perhaps it all started in this moment. Danny thinking if his father could just sleep, nothing bad would have happened. I wish we could stay here forever. Yeah, you probably noticed Jack is echoing the Grady twins, who also wanted Danny to play with them in the hotel forever and ever. And we never see the end of this scene, leaving things open-ended for a lot of the theories that we have discussed, because the immediate next scene is one of the most scrutinized sequences in all of cinema. A close-up shows Danny playing with his cars, when a tennis ball rolls up perfectly down the line of the carpet pattern, but then as he stands, notice two things. One, the carpet pattern has suddenly changed. The vertical line is now behind him. Danny was using this pattern as roadways for his cars. Now, the path before him has been closed off, 
trapping him. And two, his sweater, the Apollo 11 rocket. Now, one of the more out there interpretations of The Shining that I really don't buy is that the movie is secretly Kubrick expressing his inner breakdown over the theory that he helped the US government fake the Apollo 11 moon landing. There are some conspiracy theorists out there who believe that the film 2001 A Space Odyssey was Kubrick actually conducting a research project for what would be a film recording of the lunar surface on a sound stage. They point to what they claim are flaws in that footage and that either the Americans did go to the moon and the footage was just faked or that we never went to the moon at all. Look, there's a lot of thought diversity among the tinfoil community. They point to the fact that Kubrick changed the room number from 217, as it was in King's novel, to 237. The production said it was because the real life hotel asked him to change it so that people wouldn't be afraid to stay in that room. Conspiracy theorists claim that he changed it because the moon is 237,000 miles from Earth. It is not. It is actually 238,855 miles, but you know, whatever. They also point to the hexagonal pattern matching the design of the NASA launch pad site. And they say that there's Tang visible in the pantry and that Jack's odd rant to Wendy about having to honor his contract might be a secret cry for help from Kubrick having to honor his contract. Does it matter to you at all? that the owners have placed their complete confidence and trust in me, and that I have signed a letter of agreement, a contract in which I have accepted that responsibility. Has it ever occurred to you what would happen to my future? If I were to fail, live up to my responsibilities. Really, I think there are interpretations of what happened in Room 237 with a bit more evidence connected to the overall themes of the story. Really, I am interested in the theory that I have discussed and been disgusted in that this room is all about sex and sexual violence. Now, let's break this down. We never see the room from Danny's perspective. He just walks in through the door. Though, the scene transitions to Wendy checking the electrical equipment downstairs, and if you look closely, that area is covered in hardcore pornographic images. You might not have noticed these any of the times you've watched this movie, but they are there. And the reason we don't notice them is because Wendy doesn't react to them at all. It's almost as if she doesn't see them, as if those, along with that playgirl down the lobby and that Room 237 women are all ghostly perversions that she cannot see yet. Wendy finds Jack screaming from a nightmare. Well, I dreamed that I, that I killed you and Danny. I cut you up in little pieces. But then Danny approaches, his sweater torn, his neck bruised, sucking his thumb. Wendy asked him what happened, and he does not answer, though Kubrick frames Jack in the background between them. And as Wendy accuses Jack of another round of child abuse, she picks up Danny and notices that Danny's limbs are frozen. Apparently, Kubrick swapped out the actor Danny Lloyd with a mannequin so that this young actor wouldn't be exposed to the truly dark subject matter of this movie. So Jack heads to the gold room and notice he angrily spasms a few times as he walks down the hallway. And he only does this after he passes each mirror. Again, we are seeing how mirrors are exposing a truth about the inner darkness of this film. And that mirror device continues into the gold room where Jack sits down at an empty bar and then he makes a kind of deal with the devil. God, you have anything for a drink? I have my goddamn soul. Just a glass of beer. And right in this moment, Jack looks into the mirror on the bar's back wall. Kubrick has moved the camera so that we are now the focus of his gaze. It is so unnerving to have Jack look down the barrel of the lens like this. Normally in films, it's a mistake. Uh. Here, Jack breaks the glass of the fourth wall and the movie now shifts inside Jack's unstable mind. And the evil forces of the hotel have granted his wish a fully stocked bar and a bartender, Lloyd, who never makes Jack pay for his drinks because Jack is paying for this with his soul. Jack tells Lloyd, Just a little problem with the uh, old sperm bank upstairs. Now, it is assumed by sperm bank he is talking about Wendy, but a few seconds later, Jack abruptly transitions to Danny. I never laid a hand on him, goddammit. I didn't. But then he admits he did exactly that. I did hurt him once, okay? But he claims it was an accident, a rage-motivated accident. A little had thrown all my papers all over the floor. All I tried to do was pull them up. But then Wendy runs in screaming with a bat and Lloyd is gone, the bar empty, because she cannot yet perceive what Jack perceives. She tried to strangle Danny. Are you out of your <laughs> mind? Now, it doesn't make sense that the Room 237 woman could have physically hurt Danny. 
Halloran said the ghosts weren't real, just pictures in a book. So even if the hotel is haunted, the ghosts should only be visions that drive the human inhabitants to hurt each other. So either Danny must have given himself the bruises, as Jack said, or more likely Jack hurt him. We never see Jack enter room 237. We actually enter it through the perspective of Halloran dining into the hotel from Miami. Initially, Halloran's vision is from a low angle, the angle of Danny's height as he first entered the room. But then after showing Danny shining to him, drooling, we return to a point of view shot inside room 237, but we're now at a higher angle that floats around the room until we realize we are now seeing this from Jack's perspective. So what does this all mean? Well, one interpretation is that there is no room 237, that the room is just a dreamed recreation of a memory when Jack sexually abused Danny. There is some interesting evidence for this. Notice that the outline on the bathroom floor matches exactly the shape of the mirror through which Jack can be seen leering at Danny earlier. Also, the gesture that the woman in the tub makes to Jack matches the gesture that Jack makes to Danny earlier on, which was, remember, a creepy scene that we never saw the end of. Some also see phallus shapes in the purple and green carpeting. I don't know about that, but there is a noticeable head turn that glances at the bed in room 237 that matches Jack's earlier neck crane into Danny's room to look at his bed. I believe that room 237 does exist, mainly because Wendy knows about it. And this is before the invisible becomes visible to Wendy in the hotel. I believe Kubrick's interpretive editing could suggest that Jack and Danny were in this room together. 237 is larger than the other rooms in that hall. It has double doors compared to the single doors of the neighboring rooms. Clearly, this appears to be the hunting room suite. It's a fuck room. Danny is lured into the room with a tennis ball. We saw Jack earlier chucking a ball against the wall in the Colorado lounge. And when Jack kisses the beautiful woman, the mirror reflection again reveals the dark horrifying truth. And then we have an abrupt cut to Danny again drooling. The same way that the mirror earlier with Danny revealed the dark horrifying truth. A mirror again that matched the floor design in the bathroom. Evidence that is all there to shine a light on two of the biggest WTFs of The Shining. Danny's bruises and the bear costume blowjob dude to suggest that Danny, tragically, could be that bear. It would also explain why Jack refuses to confirm the ghost that he saw in room 237 to Wendy. Did you find anything? No, nothing at all. Even if the hotel's evil has corrupted Jack at this point, it wouldn't make sense for him to defend it and gaslight Wendy since he was clearly so shaken by that old woman ghost. I would argue his reaction could be his own guilt haunting him as he realized what he did to Danny in that room. So Jack tells Wendy he thinks Danny gave himself the bruises. Wendy suggests to take Danny out of the hotel. In this moment, Danny, <gasps> wide awake, yikes. He shines to see a quick flash of red rum because he knows that it's this moment Jack's feelings toward Wendy first become physically hostile. And we are reminded that Jack's wrath in this moment is linked to the moment at the bar because just like he looked directly into the lens there, if you go frame by frame through him storming out of the suite, he looks directly at us once again with a very sinister look. And then Jack is lured back into the gold room, now filled with guests in 1920s attire. And this now iconic music. This is Midnight the Stars and You, and it's now one of the most recognized music cues in pop culture. Toy Story 4 played it to creep us out. And in Ready Player One's recreation of the Overlook, the gold room was shot and scored the same way. Jack gets another drink and does this little dance, just like Wendy suggested earlier on the tour. Boy, I bet you we could really have a good party in this room, huh? And then Jack collides with the server, so they head in the bathroom. A strikingly red one modeled on the bathroom in the Biltmore Hotel in Arizona, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. The server tells him that his name is Grady, which raises a red flag for Jack. Weren't you once the caretaker here? You, uh, chopped your wife and daughter up into little bits. And, uh, and you blew your brains out. Now, the previous caretaker that Jack is referring to is Charles Grady from 10 years earlier. This man is Delbert Grady from the 1920s. So different first name, but he does look the same as the guy that Jack saw in the newspapers. So this shines some light on the final reveal that Jack's soul, just like Grady's soul, is trapped inside the Overlook, but in different reincarnated forms, generation after generation. You are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. I should know, sir. I've always been here. Grady reveals his more sinister agenda, warning Jack that Danny had alerted Halloran, so Jack sabotages the radio and the snowcat. Meanwhile, Danny screams, Red Rum, and speaks to Wendy only as Tony 
saying that Danny has gone away. Halloran makes his way to Colorado from Miami, and he passes a wreck with a red Volkswagen Beetle crushed. Some have interpreted this as a middle finger from Kubrick to King, since the Torrances drive a red Beetle in the book, and Kubrick changed it to a yellow one in the movie. Wendy finally discovers Jack's typed pages. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. For international versions of the film, Kubrick actually shot new takes of the pages, translated into different languages with a different work-related idiom from that country. Like in German, it was, never put off till tomorrow what can be done today. In Italian, it was, the man and it's gold in its mouth. In French, it was, one, here you go, is worth more than two, you'll have it. It's the equivalent of a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And in Spanish, it is, no matter how early you get up, you cannot make the sun rise any sooner. Jack surprises Wendy and he stalks her around the lounge, threatening her. Danny is shining to watch this all go down, and he sees that Wendy is able to keep away from Jack by walking backwards. Literally, Danny escapes from Jack in the maze by literally also walking backwards in his own footsteps. Wendy knocks Jack in the head, he falls down the stairs, and she locks him in the pantry. Later, Jack speaks to Grady through the door, and mysteriously, the door unlocks. You give your word on that deal, Mr. Torrance? I give you my word. If we assume that all the phenomena of the Overlook can be explained by physical logic or delusion, this is the only moment that cannot be explained. One theory for how Jack could have escaped is Danny, or more specifically, Tony. And maybe Tony is enabling Jack's insanity throughout this process in order to lure him into the maze so that he'll freeze to death. But the moment Jack gets out, Danny writes red rum with Wendy's lipstick on the bathroom door, shouting at her until she wakes up and sees it reflected as murder in the mirror. It's another example of how the dark truth of The Shining is not presented in front of us, it can only be reflected in mirrors. Jack axes his way into the apartment, and he taunts him through the bathroom door. Little pigs, little pigs, let me come in. Not by the hair on your chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in. This line is inspired by the shiny novel, the characters that the bear costume and his lover were based on. In the book, it was a dog costume actually, and he's worn by a guy named Roger, lover of the hotel owner, Horace Derwent. At one point, Danny hears them having sex in another room. Roger screams for him to get it up, saying, I'll huff and I'll puff until Harry Derwent's all blown down. Jack axes into the bathroom and hits us with that money line. Here's Johnny. <laughs> Apparently Nicholson ad-libbed the line and Kubrick didn't watch The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson so he had no idea what he was referencing. But then Jack hears Halloran pulling up so Danny hides in the kitchen, something Spielberg later nodded to with Jurassic Park. Jack jumps out from behind a column to murder Halloran. Halloran's death is not in vain because he is the one distraction that separates Jack from Danny and Wendy, allowing them to later escape. And now that all the insanity has broken loose, gotten out there in the open, finally, Wendy also perceives all the evil in the hotel, hearing its voices and seeing its demons. I think there's enough evidence to make it valid to interpret this as the moment Wendy perhaps puts two and two together about Jack's sexual abuse of Danny, or it's totally okay to just interpret this as the backstory from the novel that was left out from the film. Wendy runs into another ghost with a bloody head. Great party, isn't it? This is another line from the book spoken by Derwent to Wendy and Danny. The final act of the book plays out quite differently. Again, there's no hedge maze, there's no blood elevator, but the ghosts of the hotel play a much bigger role. There are hedge statues outside that come to life. Instead, we just see Wendy witnessing the lobby in classic horror imagery and blood gushing out of the elevator. Meanwhile, Jack, the Minotaur, chases Danny through the hedge maze outside. But we know Danny has an advantage. We saw him specifically spending time playing in this maze with his mother earlier. He knows how to find its center. And his shining ability taught him that looking and moving backwards is the road to salvation. So Jack, chasing him, finds that Danny's footprints have just disappeared. He's lost in despair because from his perspective, Danny has just vanished into thin air. Jack's insanity has consumed him, trapped him in the heart of the maze. Kubrick underscores this defeat by shooting Jack silhouetted further and further away from the camera with the darkness closing in around him. Danny and Wendy escape, Jack, freezes to death. Now, before the iconic final shot, there was actually a deleted scene set in a hospital in which Danny and Wendy are visited by Mr. Ullman, who explains that there was no evidence of ghosts or elevator blood anywhere. But he leaves Danny with the ball that was rolled to him outside room 237. 
The idea was that Ullman was a kind of ambassador for the ghostly death trap of the Overlook, and that perhaps he told Jack the story of Charles Grady in order to trigger his insanity. All the best people. But the scene was removed, probably for the better, because instead, the film leaves us on this slow push in on the black and white photographs that have covered the hotel walls throughout the film. We didn't think to look at them, but now we see the one right in the middle, the group shot. Jack is standing there among the guests. July 4th, 1921. As Grady explained to us earlier, Jack has always been the caretaker his soul trapped inside the Overlook. And Kubrick has confirmed that the ballroom photograph at the end suggests a reincarnated version of Jack. So whether or not you interpret The Shining as a story about violence against Native Americans or the Holocaust or sexual abuse, you cannot deny that it is a story about how historical violence lingers as a weight on the future generation. And only by looking backward to embrace those past horrors can we escape that violence from consuming us as well. A truth that was there the whole time. We just simply overlooked it. Okay, thank you for joining me in this analysis of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Thank you for watching, and uh, I've always been New Rockstar's caretaker.